enterprise junkies. I want to start, we have a terrific conversation, but I think it's interesting to just talk about enterprise tech, because I think one of the impressions that a lot of us have is it's either those are the people where you put on a suit and you start talking about ultra, ultra low latency and, and stuff like that, or it's just upgrading your picture on LinkedIn and bringing Twitter into the companies. It's obviously something very different. All the disruptive technology that we've seen transform the consumer space, I think is really accelerating right now in the enterprise space. It's very hot. We have two of the hottest men in the industry with us right ah. here to help us in the enterprise tech space. They will live up to it, I promise. Right. We have uh, Lou Cerny here, CEO, founder of New Relic, <coughs> um, and John Hayes, co-founder and chief architect of Pure Star Storage. So Lou, I'm gonna start with you. Um, you started New Relic back in 2008. This is the longest, I think, you're a serial entrepreneur. It's the longest you've been in this role. Give me some sense of what prompted you to start it and what are you seeing right now in the market? Sure, so it's interesting you mentioned it's kind of the longest run with this. I definitely founded the company with a goal of making this um, a company that had real durability and hopefully outlast myself. Or, um, <clears throat> um, and that's rare in enterprise software, but at the core of it, um, I think we have a chance because we're at such an interesting time right now. Um, <clears throat> you know, people spend so much time in front of software. It's, it's, it's increasingly becoming just how we spend most of our lives. And life's too short for bad software. Like that, you know, if you're, if you're spending eight hours a day at work using uh, technology products, it shouldn't be painful. It shouldn't be like taking medicine. It should be a joyful experience. Certainly the consumer companies get that. Um, and I think that um, the traditional enterprise software companies don't, don't understand that. It's not their DNA. And so there's this opportunity for companies that get um, how important great software is to making people's lives better. Um, and, and, and to have an impact. And, and at New Relic, our mission is to help companies deliver great software experiences for their customers, and we do that by measuring everything about the software. So we think it's a big mission, and we have an opportunity to have an impact. So, and I want to talk a little bit about what's different about the enterprise. John, I want to go to you a second, because you, with Pure Storage, you were very much looking to disrupt behemoths like EMC. Give me some sense as to, do you come out bl guns blazing in that situation? Do you come out in stealth mode? Because <coughs> one of the things about enterprise is you've had big players like Cisco, Oracle, Sa you know, SAS. What was your strategy and tell me why you also brought on a CEO, not call yourself CEO? Um, so our strategy was come out guns blazing and that's because fundamentally our product is really simple. And what we had to do was break through the idea that products could be much better than they are. And it took a lot to explain that, much more than you would think, because expectations- You can't just say 10 times faster, 10 times cheaper, nimbler, stronger. Well, everyone, everyone says that. And so the question is, how do you prove it? And you have to say it over and over and over again. And, and basically change the expectation for what people want. In, in our case, in storage, which hadn't changed for almost 20 years before we, five years ago, there was this great blossoming of new technologies and no one was prepared for it. And it took a lot to push that into the market. Um, we hired a CEO because, well, I'm not qualified. I'm a tech person. My co-founder, John Colpgrove, also a tech person. And we knew that we could uh, push the implementation, build the product we wanted to build, but we also needed much more talented people than us to run the company drive sales, drive all the functions of what we need to do to make our vision actually work. So one of the things that I think people think about with enterprise tech, it immediately evokes being a Larry Ellison, a John Chambers, you know, all the people who essentially were maybe 1.0. Lou, give me some sense of what in fact is different when you're building mm -hmm. an enterprise company these days. I mean, is it a bit of a false divide? You talk about delight. Yeah. I mean, hey, you, everybody's turning to the enterprise. Facebook you know, has an enterprise strategy. I mean, what, what's not enterprise? Well, I think what's different these days about what you see in enterprise leadership is that um, you increasingly see product-centric enterprise companies. I think of New Relic as a product-first company. Hasn't that always been the case? No, no. I mean, I think a lot of the most successful companies, particularly in the 90s and the early 2000s, were channel-centric, sales-centric companies. Um, and that's why you saw all these acquisitions, these big companies would just acquire stuff to shove through the channel and they really didn't care that much what the products were or whether they fit together. Um, whereas at New Relic, 
Um, we, we have five different SKUs. We built them all from scratch, lovingly made, like organic made software, right? And uh, Artisanal yeah, software. It, no, but we care about the details. It's in the core of what we do. And, you know, I go away six weeks every year. I, six times a year, I take a one week coding retreat, which is That's a right, little odd for a public CEO. company CEO. But, um, but I, I, I feel like it's a way for me to help think and stay connected to the technology. And sometimes ideas come out that, you know, drive the product direction. But, you know, that's, that type of leader wouldn't be running public tech, com tech companies 10 years ago. But now I think the market's recognizing that the innovative companies, um, it's not one good idea. You've got to have a system that continues to generate great innovations on an ongoing basis. One of the concerns every company <coughs> has is, are you going to be around? you know, six months from now. So they all love the idea of the, you know, young startup, but they want clarity and predictability. And how did you sort of get in and start to steal business away from bigger, more predictable companies? Obviously, there's the advantages. Was that sufficient? Anything you think that is also important? So early on, we had to market on things that were much, much better. Almost every company we sold into in the beginning had some very specific pain that they couldn't solve any other way. And so that, that was the baseline. It was sort of the classic crossing the chasm. Hmm. And it just takes time to build up a reputation. Um, one of the differences with enterprise products is there's a great deal of trust involved. Because if you fail, you can take out their entire business. And so you can't fail, and you have to earn or, or a reputation for actually working. Um, and that's just a slow process to build up, and there's no way around it. Uh, at the same time, we had to make that real. We had to focus on the inside and, get, and getting better all the time because every single failure is magnified much more than an incumbent company. Hmm. Uh, so th is this every was failure magnified? Because so, so give me a sense of even just how you hire or if you hire differently. You know, I think, for example, when you're selling into the enterprise, I would think that industry expertise is more important. Um, I don't know even if talent is a bigger issue. I mean, it's easier for me to tell my mom, hey, I work at Google than I work at a company right. where I then have to add a sentence as to what they do and then mm -hmm. add another sentence as to what that is. Lou, what's been your experience? Well, I think there's a benefit to it, actually, because there's a filtering or self-selection process of people that actually interview at New Relic, by and large, know who we are and care about what we do. And uh, that's, that's a core requirement for us. That's more important to us than the resume is, are they passionate about the mission? So are they going to bring their very best? You know, I, I speak all the time at my company about how, uh, for me, it's important for me to love my Mondays. I want to look forward to, uh, to, to doing what I do professionally, and I want that to be true for all of our employees. Um, and and, and if, you, if you love your Mondays, then, then you're not distracted by, um, by, by things like what's going to happen in the, in the more, uh, that's outside of your control, right? You focus that's on true what in you every influence. company, right? I mean, if you're... That's true, but, but, but basically there are these like well-known consumer companies that are just going to attract people that are just looking for a job. Right. And, 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 and so they go to like, you know, the lowest, co you're not the lowest, common, the, most, the most commonly known companies. Um, so there's a what downside. About, what's, what's, your, what's your advice? You're an enterprise tech company, you're hiring. Any sort of thoughts as to what you would do even differently or what you've learned about hiring for this um, space? So... We, there's actually a really big divide in our company. Most of our sales staff is from storage companies, incumbent storage companies. <coughs> Almost none of our engineering staff is. We look for, uh, we actually test skills and then fit, and it's a very abstract process. It's kind of like more like an SAT than looking at someone's resume. Because the, one of the nice things about being in the middle of a technology change is everything is new anyways. Mm -hmm. So we actually didn't want people with lots and lots of storage experience. Um, we because they're not going to disrupt? They have too much of a sense of the status quo being OK? Well, that and maybe it's my own bias. I'd never worked in storage before this either. And the, the structure of the product and the kind of company we wanted to build was very, very different. And so you need different people to actually make that happen. It's interesting. You know, we've seen so many places want to be tech hubs. We've got you know downtown Las Vegas, Ireland, Silicon Valley, Silicon Alley. Do you find there's any, um, does Silicon Valley still have a lot of natural advantages when it comes to the enterprise tech space? Is it less so? I mean, I feel like we should have the invest in Canada folks <laughs> here, by the way, because we're all Canadian and we're not talking about Canada. So there you go, out of the way. But, but give me some sense as to 
what you think the, the Silicon Valley equation is, because that's essentially been, you know, the mecca that everybody yeah. thinks about in the consumer tech space. Any thoughts about well, that? I mean, there's, there's positives and negatives. Um, there is certainly some uh, tunnel vision of just, or, you know, echo chamber uh, factors where, you know, the, 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 the commonly held viewpoints in Silicon Valley don't take into account the broader world often. Um, but there is something special about the fact that there are so many companies in Silicon Valley um, that, that people, you know, can move from, from company to company, hopefully after a significant 10 years where they've really had an impact. But then that knowledge they can bring in from another company like a Google or a LinkedIn or, um, or, or Salesforce or pick your company, right? That, that knowledge and that expertise can help grow your company. Whereas if everybody's only worked at one company like Armonk, New York, I IBM, like it's all IBMers, right? So you, you don't get that dif difference of perspective in, in that sense. Are there disadvantages? Um, so there are definitely disadvantages with having perspective with your customers. Most of our early customers were actually like Midwest manufacturing companies, city councils, very uh, schools, very business, mid-range businesses that people don't think of as adopting new technologies. Well, I mean, the first thing is a business isn't innovative, a person is. So you have to find the person within that business. But it's, it's also important, and it's something that you have to make a deliberate effort in Silicon Valley, is to cultivate respect for your customers who aren't other tech companies. Now, even in Silicon Valley, there's lots and lots of tiny subregions. Within, I think, uh, two miles of our office, there are 10 other storage companies. And so, even within Silicon Valley, these, little, these sort of super clusters actually exist. So, give me some sense as to what's because everybody talks about enterprise tech being so hot right now, what do you think is changing? What, what in fact, how is the landscape <clears throat> going to look differently? And, you know, if I gave you each $5 million, what would you short? But, but if, if not that, you know, what do you think is making it such a hot space at the moment? And what do you think are some of the misperceptions, you know, the overhyped or underappreciated? So... I, I think there's two things. I mean, the, the curve we're riding is technology change. But then there's also um, more what Lou is riding, sort of a, a cultural change, in that enterprise and consumer are a lot more like each other than they used to be. The, people it changes think, how you sell to them. And exactly. It changes. You, you think about in terms of bring your own device. Well, that's now affecting software. It's affecting infrastructure, where you're selling from the bottom up. Like, we, you know, when I think of what causes people to rebuy our product, it's not that, it's not about performance, it's about that people who actually have to use it get their evenings and weekends back mm -hmm. because they can actually work on it during the day without it blowing up. Um, and so I, I think that the big change in enterprise is it is now a fundamentally more bottom-up type product. Yes, no question. And, and I, I learned something quite stunning to me that, in, uh, but it makes sense when you hear it. Um, because of the internet and how transparent information is compared to 10, 15 years ago, uh, purchasers of enterprise technology are 54% through their purchasing decision before they engage with a salesperson. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. So, so you can't be thinking about, I've got, like, I've got control over the message to the customer when they engage with me. It, it, it's far prior to the sales engagement. So think about that with, and often how they get their information is by trying out the product or trying out your competitor's product. So. You, you want to make, you want to obsess on that. Like, how does somebody discover and fall in love with your product without somebody there to handhold them? And this is just a foreign concept from the incumbents. Mm. They are so into, like, you know, the, the, the PowerPoint presentation, then the white glove install, then the long negotiation, then the purchase, right? And, and we designed our company from the ground up where we obsess. Actually, the inspiration for it was I founded the company the year the iPhone came out, the first iPhone. That was the first phone you could activate on your own. You didn't need someone in the store to turn on the phone for you, right? And I thought, we should do that in enterprise software. We shouldn't like, require an SE to set up this software for me. People should be able to set it up. There's a joy in having the control over the, your own consumption experience. So how important experience. is the CIO or CTO to sell to? The Are best they CIOs, like, do, they, do they show up They've got to think <laughs> offense with software, not defense. They can't be thinking about cutting costs. They've got to think about empowering the frontline people to be as productive as possible. And I think those are the four things CEOs that are growing in, in influence and they're getting promoted, whereas the people that are all they're thinking about is how do I reduce the cost, do what I did last year faster, cheaper, they're not gonna have jobs in five years. I really believe that. So, so I think give, give some real concrete advice, even in terms of personally, you know, what weaknesses did you feel you had to, you know, for example, supplement? You are the coding CEO. Yeah. When you're building 
you know, an enterprise tech company, what advice do you have to people who are actually, you know, they want to get into the enterprise themselves? The rules are changing so quickly. What would be your observations as to you know, I think the most it. important lessons you can learn, and this is a guaranteed thing you're going to learn if you start a company, you'll learn more about yourself and discover your weaknesses. So and what are your weaknesses? Oh my goodness. Well, I can't, I, 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 I have a short attention span. I can't sit in long meetings, so I don't go to meetings. I've hired yeah. a great president who goes to meetings. If a meeting has more than six people, it's, I, go, I don't go. Except, should, except my board meeting tomorrow. I have to legally go to my board meeting tomorrow. But other than that, um, I, uh, I'm not, uh, you know, operational planning. I am, uh, I am not uh, into, um, uh, uh, you know, the administrative side. But I, so I hire world-class people that, in, in some cases, they could be great CEOs. And, and if, they, if they were CEOs, they'd probably be complimenting themselves with people more with my skill set. I'm, I'm passionate about innovation, I'm passionate about um, telling the story about our company, um, and I'm passionate about attracting great people to the cause, and so that's what I like to do. How about yourself? Um, so I almost think that I'm the opposite. I, I love building the product so you much. You love meetings? Uh -huh. uh, no, stuff. okay, no, I don't <laughs> like meetings. Um, I love building the product so much. I think there was, it took me a, a while to figure out that explaining a product is really, really hard. And, and the simpler it is, and the more you have to explain, avoid, like something that... So give us the one word, I think, pure flash storage. It's, I mean, give me, what's the, what's the immediate elevator pitch that, that you've honed? I mean, because I think that is one of the challenges in enterprise. It's like, okay, okay, what are you selling, and when can I have it? But what, what, is, what have you found hard to explain? Um, I found hard to explain the things that you don't have to do anymore. And so... We focused on making product that's super, super simple. So there's a huge list of things that don't take time anymore. So it shows up, you plug it in, you have storage, works well. Um, in a market when, where most of our competitors market speed, we market simplicity. Because we think ultimately that's more important. To come back to Lou's comment on the CIO, a lot of CIOs spend 90% of their time just trying to operate what they have. Right. And, and how do we, <clears throat> Hmm. reduce that to like 70%, so they have 30% of their time on innovation instead of 10% of their time on innovation. So I don't want to um, be oblivious to the fact that people really do want to see around the corner and what's happening here. I mean, there is, we're in a um, space where obviously the cycle of winner to loser is a matter of months, sometimes years. How quickly do you feel um, the giants in enterprise tech are, are being disrupted, and what do you see the landscape looking like three, five years from now? I mean, give us some sense of what you get excited about. Lou, I'm going to start with you because you've been well, you know, there aren't, there aren't many software companies. I, there are less than 10 software companies in existence with more than a uh, billion in revenue. Um, uh, and, and one of them is a SaaS company, Salesforce. And so I predict um, that the traditional software companies are going to continue to consolidate and or decline. Um, and that if you look at the top 10 software companies five or 10 years ago, years from now, um, at least half of them will be Salesforce or newer, and they're all gonna be cloud companies. And they're gonna have the mindset of delivering amazing products people love to use. Um, and so that's exciting, we wanna be one of them. Um, and, uh, and, and I think it's good for people who consume enterprise technology to actually have products that you actually like to use. And what about yourself? What do you, give me some sense of how you see the landscape changing, especially since, again, you're in a space. Things, it's hard to disrupt legacy systems. It's hard to pivot billion-dollar customers, never mm -hmm. mind your own create a billion-dollar company. Um, so I, I think that the opportunity is that there's a technology change that makes the excuse to make a new product. But at the same time, there's also cloud is a big force, and it's a big force not because it's in someone else's data center versus yours, but because it's a massive change in usability. And so the, I think that the existing companies, there's gonna be incumbent, they're all tearing each other apart as well, like we're just a part of it, but you're gonna end up with at least a couple of new large companies in enterprise infrastructure. Like what, besides yourselves? Well, I, mean, <laughs> I, 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 I can't predict uh, which, which companies will survive, but that's, that's what happened last time. That's how we have the current slate of companies we have, is you go back to the early 90s, and there was, this, there was a big transition to open systems, and that formed the winners that we have today. 
were all declared in the early 90s, and they've been stable since then. And it's going to be turned over again. Okay, so we're, we have um, less than a minute left, so I'll give you each 30 seconds. Give some takeaway that you think is important. Let's crystallize it down to how to build an enterprise company. What advice do you have? What would you be thinking about? Any poem, fortune cookie, motto? What do you have, Lou? <laughs> um, I feel like when you're big, big, beginning to, you know, when you're founding a company, you're thinking about the problem you want to solve. Think hard, not only about the business model and the product, but how the product and business model work together. The product ought to be built with the business model in mind. The business model has to be built with the product in mind. For example, that whole, how do people discover your product and fall in love without the help of a sales engineer or a sales rep? Um, that, that's as important as what does your product actually do once they're using it. Okay. Final words to you, John. Um, so. Enterprise products and is, are more similar to consumer products. And I go even further and say the way technology is flowing is from consumer to enterprise. Consumer has all the new technology and hardware today, and it, it's coming into enterprise. Um, but in addition, when you're marketing to enterprise, you have to think about how that affects every single constituent in the company. And that's something that's very distinct. To one person. You're not you have to make one person love you, but you have to make five people understand you, because there's Excellent. five people who can say no. That's good. So make one person love you and five people understand you're good to go. Please join me in thanking these two gentlemen. Obviously, it's Thank a you. space we'll be talking about a lot more. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.